simple and short a pleasure of mine just to uh, welcome each and every one of you this evening, friends and colleagues and distinguished guests who are joining us this evening for the annual Monsignor Patrick Corch Lecture. Uh, it's just a welcome to you, Professor Ryan, and also uh, the chosen lecturer this year, Professor Ken Van Ox, a very, very welcome uh, to us. And I know to the staff that we'll introduce them shortly. I just want to say a very few short words on, on Monsignor Corch, Patrick Corch, and indeed to you. Very little introduction to most of you and I'm not the most worthy to even do this, but uh, college is 222 years old this year, and it's hard to believe that Professor Cor uh, uh, Monsignor Corridge was going to do his uh, almost 70 <coughs> years, one third of the history of the college. He lived his life here, he came here in 1939 as a seminarian. He was ordained here in 45, he then did his doctorate in uh, uh, the uh, theology, and then was appointed professor of ecclesiastical history, and also was appointed then also later on for one year president of the college before returning to his first passion, that is to teach and to write. Uh, we all know his well works. I was one of his students, I think, for a year. Uh, I'm not sure how much I appreciated the skill of his teaching at the time, but he was a very entertaining but also very wise teacher. Uh, he, he published, as you know, the Irish Catholic Experience, the history of the college here, was involved in the Archivium uh, Hibernicum, and also was very involved in the preparing the beatification cause for the Irish martyrs a very important work which he did. And he's, he still lives on in the sense that uh, just barely a week or a few days go by when an anecdote about him is not recalled in the dining room. And uh, when he's also recently was remembered by a lovely memorial that was placed in what really is his garden, the Junior Gardens. And really, I suppose, it should be renamed the Corish Gardens because they're so associated with him. But perhaps the most fitting memorial for him, a man of his contribute so much to the academic life of the college, particularly the Department of History, and what was then uh, NUIM and now the Leeds University, and in creating uh, and making it a preeminent uh, department within the arts faculty in the university. And so this uh, lecture series every year, this lecture, annual lecture, is perhaps the best and most fitting uh, mem memorial for him. So we salute and remember him this evening, and uh, uh, we recall his memory each year, and wish you every success in this lecture this evening and I would now invite Salvador Ryan to uh, introduce him. Paolo Iori is a Borghese poet. You are all very welcome to this year's Monsignor Patrick J. Corish lecture. And it gives me great pleasure this evening to introduce Professor Candida Moss. Born in London, Professor Moss graduated from Worcester College in Oxford in 2000, the year 2000, with a BA in Theology. In 2002, she received an MAR in Biblical Studies from Yale Divinity School, and in 2006, graduated from Yale University with an MA and MPhil in Religious Studies followed by a PhD in Religious Studies in 2008. In 2012, Professor Moss was appointed as Professor of New Testament and Early Christianity at the University of Notre Dame, where she was also a concurrent Professor of Classics, and where she worked until just this past August when she was appointed the Edward Cadbury Professor of Theology at the University of Birmingham. Professor Moss has authored or co-edited seven books and numerous articles. Her first book, The Other Christs, Imitating Jesus in Ancient Christian Ideologies of Martyrdom, was published by University, uh, Oxford University Press in 2010. And it was soon followed by a number of other titles, including Disability Studies in Biblical Literature, co-edited with Jeremy Schiffer and published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2011. Ancient Christian Martyrdom, Diverse Practices, Ideologies, and Traditions, published by Yale University Press in 2012. The Myth of Persecution, 
How Early Christians Invented a Story of Martyrdom, published with Harper One in 2013. By my reckoning, that's a book a year already. After which came Reconceiving Infertility, Biblical Perspectives on Procreation and Childlessness, co-authored with Joel Baden and published by Princeton University Press in 2015. And if you're listening closely, um, I don't know what happened in 2014. It must have been a jubilee year. Um, and then this year, Professor Ross has already published The Other Side, Apocryphal Perspectives on Ancient Christian Orthodoxies, co-edited with uh, Tobias uh, Nicholas and published by Vanderhoof and Ruprecht in, in this year. And also this year, Bible Nation, the United States of Hobby Lobby, co-authored with Joel Baden and published by Princeton uh, University Press. And this tells the story of the evangelical Green family of Oklahoma City and their rapid acquisition of an unparalleled collection of biblical antiquities and the construction of a $500 million museum of the Bible near the National Mall in Washington, D.C. And it argues that this raises serious ethical questions about the trade in biblical antiquities and indeed the integrity of academic research. Professor Ma Moss's uh, forthcoming book, which encompasses the subject of tonight's lecture, is entitled Heavenly Bodies, uh, Resurrecting Perfection in the New Testament and Early Christianity. Now, among other marks of distinction, Professor Moss has received uh, the Charlotte W. Newcomb Award from the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation, the John Templeton Award for Theological Promise, and an NEH Summer Seminar Grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. In 2015, she was shortlisted for the Kate Prize and a Religion News Writers Association Award. In the following year, 2016, her co-authored book, Reconceiving Infertility, was shortlisted for the American Academy of Religion Book Prize for Textual Studies. And she was elected a member of Studiorum Novi Testamenti Societas in 2013. Now, apart from her numerous scholarly contributions, Professor Moss has become very well known as a prominent public intellectual. And her popular writings and extensive media work have ensured that the enthusiasm she clearly has for the subjects of theology and history of Christianity is shared far beyond the confines of the academy. And speaking of popularizing theology, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Jeremy Corbyn's carpool, no, that's James Corbyn's <laughs> carpool karaoke. Uh, but if you are, um, in, in researching Professor Moss's career, I did come across what can only be described as an early Christian historian's version of carpool karaoke, in which Professor Moss attempts to explain in a few minutes of a taxi drive uh, the cult of early Christian martyrdom. It does lead me to wonder what our taxi driver this morning actually learnt on his way from the airport with Professor Moss. Now, Professor Moss has served as an academic consultant to the television series uh, The Bible. Uh, she has served as a, a commentator on religious and papal affairs for CBS News, Fox News, and CNN, and is a frequent contributor to the National Geographic Channel. In addition, she's contributed to The Atlantic, Los Angeles Times, Political Magazine, New York Times, Washington Post, Huffington Post, The Chronicle of Higher Education, and Times Higher Education Supplement. She's also a weekly col columnist for The Daily Beast, an American news and opinion website in which she has written on a dizzying array of topics, including recent posts on, is the lost city of Alexander the Great actually his? Inside the deadly pursuit of unsolved languages, the world's most famous missing menorah, the thousand year history of nose jobs, and <laughs> In good time, I think, for the approaching holiday season, yes, Virginia, we have found Santa's bones. <laughs> now, although Professor Moss has visited Ireland on a couple of occasions in the past, this is her very first time to deliver an academic lecture in this country. 
For that reason, among many others, I would like, on behalf of St. Patrick's College, Maynooth, to extend a very warm welcome uh, to you, Canada. We are delighted that in the midst of your very busy schedule and many speaking engagements that you've taken the time to visit us here and travel to Maynooth to deliver this year's Monsignor Patrick J. Cornish Lecture on Dying to Live Forever, Identity and Virtue in the Resurrection of the Bodies of the Martyrs. Thank you very much for that introduction. I'm clearly going to have to give more thought to the titles that other people select for my articles. Um, good evening. I'd like to begin by thanking St. Patrick's College for this enormous honour and Salvador Ryan in particular for the invitation to deliver the Courage Lecture to you tonight. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming except those of you who are in Professor Ryan's class and are getting some kind of additional credit. I'm not thanking you. In the second century, a Christian author known to us as the Athenian Christian philosopher Athenagoras wrote a defense of the resurrection of the flesh. In contrast to those who argued that the resurrection was purely spiritual, that's a pneumatic body, Athenagoras describes resurrection as a process by which God would draw together again dead bodies or even those entirely decomposed and restore them again to the very same humans. So the very same matter that makes up your body now would be gathered together and returned to you in the future, the same pieces of flesh, the same pieces of bone and hair that cling to your person now. Those would be scooped up and reassembled on Judgment Day. A hypothesis like this, of course, leads to a number of questions, including the decidedly difficult issue of what would happen to a Christian at the resurrection if her body was eaten by an animal after her death. This was a hypothetical problem that was particularly acute for anyone who had read Ignatius of Antioch's final missive, his letter to the Romans, in which he expresses a longing to be consumed alive by the wild beasts, saying that he hopes that they will leave no piece of him left. The issue, of course, is digestion. According to ancient medical theories, digestion works when the body of the gourmet assumes the body of the thing that they were eating. Bodies are made up of other bodies, and you are what you eat. This theory of digestion doesn't pose many problems when it comes to eating animals or fish, but what would happen to a person whose improperly buried corpse was eaten by a lion? What would happen, moreover, if that lion was then eaten by a person? Would the identities of these two unfortunates be forever linked? Anyone who's ever seen the 1970s horror movie, The Fly, knows exactly what people were worrying about. The difficulty, clearly no one, by the way. The difficulty is even more serious, Athenagoras tells us, in instances of direct and deliberate cannibalism. Greek mythology brims with stories of children being served to their unknowing parents. But it was not just the stuff of cultural taboo. Cannibalism lurked according to popular belief at the borders of the empire and was known to have happened in moments of desperation. When human flesh is nurtured by human flesh, is it possible to separate them out again? Who would want to be raised from the dead to find themselves monstrously fused to another person? The concept was so outrageously repulsive that it disturbed even some of the wisest of Athenagoras' acquaintance. If you're wondering what's happening here, this is a vision had by a verger in which St. Cosmos and Damien um, try to perform a surgery on a man with an infected leg, and so they cut it off, but they realize they need another leg, so they go get one from the cemetery. I know. 
After this exposition, Athenagoras tells us, once people hear about this kind of thing, the critics think that they are right to draw the conclusion that the resurrection cannot take place because it is not possible for two men to be resurrected with the same flesh at the same time. In the end, either the disputed parts will be returned to the original owners, leaving a gap in the later owners, or they should be fixed in the latter, leaving in this case an irreparable loss in the former. Athenagoras explained that God had preordained that certain foodstuffs for each, for each species would be appropriate. And as a consequence, animals simply cannot digest any kind of matter, but only food that can properly be called food according to nature. So that that was contrary to nature, he said, would just be expelled from the body like fruit pips or corn kernels. So to humans, eating human flesh is like consuming cotton wool buds. It fills the belly, but it doesn't line the stomach. Athenagoras is actually not the only Christian to discuss this. The cannibal problem or the chain consumption problem, as it is somewhat less salaciously known, is much discussed in the writings of other Christian apologists, like the North Africans Tertullian and Augustine, the Roman writer Tatian, and the Alexandrian Origen. To modern ears, as to ancient ones, cannibalism, digestion, and bodily reconstitution are at least mildly repulsive. They invoke the basest bodily function and target trans-historical anxieties about the treatment of corpses and the violation of the body. Just the idea that a body could be eaten by animals causes concern. We might think here of the very high price that the occupants of Troy paid for the return of the body of Hector. Or we could recall the outrage that Irish New Testament scholar John Dominic Crossan provoked when he suggested that the body of Jesus was not buried, it was likely to have been discarded and eaten by dogs. The issue with Crossan's hypothesis, which was very famous in the 90s, was not just that it challenged the resurrection narratives, which of course it does, but rather the way in which it recalls a violation of Jesus's body. The human response that we feel to this violation is only amplified when the consumers of human cadavers are not animals, but people. There is, as anthropologist Jonathan Marx has written, no greater taboo than cannibalism, and thus the opponents of fleshy resurrection seek to elicit our disgust. In the words of Celsus, a Roman opponent of Christianity in the second century, corpses ought to be thrown out as worse than done. In the history of scholarship, the commitment of Orthodox writers like Athenagoras to the resurrection of a putrefied, potentially digested flesh has demanded explanation. Why would these authors fight so hard to rehabilitate the utterly repulsive. In one form or another, the traditional scholarly answer has been the experience of persecution and martyrdom. Executed criminals, and executed cr Christian criminals in particular, were regularly denied proper burial. They were instead thrown into the Tiber where they were eaten by fish, they were cast into pits to be eaten by stray dogs, and more than one of them would have lost some flesh to a wild animal in the arena. Thus, in the historical context of rampant, or of, as I have argued, not so rampant persecution, indiscriminate executions, and the regular defilement of Christian bodies after death, Christians began to develop we are told, an eschatological vision in which the imperium of God would supersede that of temporal powers. The reality of distended bodies prompted Christians to wrestle with the questions of bodily restitution. Thus, Caroline Walker Bynum can write, quite matter-of-factly, that the paradox of change and continuity that characterizes theological and hagiographical descriptions of the risen body 
seems to originate in the facts of martyrdom. Now, I know that she's my predecessor in delivering this lecture, so I will tread carefully here. Certainly, there is something to the idea that early Christian martyrdom stories envision the resurrection of the martyr as a moment of victory and restitution. The Romans thought they were crushing you when they executed you, but aha, God will resurrect you and you showed him. There's something to that, but it was not necessary that martyrs actually wait until the resurrection to receive some kind of heavenly reward. Broadly speaking, like Jesus, early Christians believed that their martyrs ascended to heaven at the moment of their death, their martyrdom serving as a kind of passport to the heavenly throne. The extent to which the rapidity of the ascension of martyrs to heaven is part of an imitatio Christi hinges upon contemporary notions about resurrection as it was more generally construed. After all, if everyone ascends to heaven at death, the exaltation of the martyrs is decidedly less remarkable. Thus, in contrast to sort of the ordinary, pious, faithful, occasionally sinful dead, the martyrs did not have to wait for final judgment to ca catch their first glimpse of eternal life. They neither slept beneath the ground nor twiddled their thumbs in pneumatic storage facilities. On the contrary, the acts of the martyrs display a very consistent belief in the translocation of the souls of the martyrs to the heavenly throne at the very moment of death. In the words of Robin Lane Fox, the martyrs bypass the long delays, the intervals of cooling and refreshment, the minor corrections and discipline, the years of waiting in Abraham's bosom. They sped straight to Christ and his father. The promise of bodily resurrection actually entered the grammar of martyrdom long before Jesus walked the dusty roads of Galilee. Throughout their examinations and tortures, the heroes of the Maccabean revolt display absolute confidence that their bodies too will be restored to them in the resurrection. This posthumous vindication and restoration is in turn linked to the notion of divine creation. One brother proclaims that he received his hands from heaven and can expect to get them back again. Another, his mother actually, refers to God as the creator of the world. Rhetorically, their confidence in resurrection resists the king's efforts to threaten and constrain them. The ultimate victory of the brothers is not threatened by dismemberment or disfigurement. In many respects, it is not just the exercise of power, but mythological accounts of the afterlife that are being subverted here. Whereas Greek myth maintained that proper burial was a prerequisite for safe passage to Hades, and that disfigurement in death imprinted itself eternally on the shade of even the noblest warrior, the Maccabean martyrs are confident that their god will be able to restore them to holy, wholeness. And in this way, Greek might is thwarted by Jewish eschatology. At the same time, there is enormous diversity of opinion among the authors of martyrdom accounts about what the afterlife looked like for the martyrs. So even the famous Bishop Polycarp, who is very interested in fleshy resurrection, against him we might posit the acts of Justin and his companions, and the acts of Apollonius, which are both Roman martyrdom accounts written across the Mediterranean from Asia Minor, where Polycarp died. In the Acts of Apollonius, the protagonist sums up his views of the afterlife and of what it means to be a Christian, saying that it means to believe that the soul is immortal, uh, to be convinced that there will be judgment after death and there will be a reward given by God after the resurrection to those who have lived a just life for their labors on behalf of virtue. Now, nowhere in this description, which he gives almost immediately before his death, is there a straightforward reference to fleshy resurrection, the stuff that you're wearing right now. 
On the contrary, most scholars would tell you that Apollonius is concerned with the immortality of the soul. And when he says resurrection, he means spiritual resurrection, a pneumatic body. A similar move is made in the second century Acts of Justin, in which Justin articulates the resurrection in terms of Stoic doctrine about the world being consumed by fire. For the, all those who live a good life, there exists the divine gift even to the conflagration of the world. And that word for conflagration, for those of you who read Greek, is ekpyrosis, technical Stoic terminology for the world being consumed by fire before restarting. And so thus, in this way, we can see that there's a variety of opinions about what the afterlife will be like, even in these narratives about the deaths of these saints. Despite the diversity of thinking in these narratives about martyrdom, the second and third century Christian theologians who were hashing out the specifics of fleshy resurrection invoke the martyrs in a fairly monolithic way. In the contest between advocates of spiritual and fleshy resurrection, the martyrs become a central example of the necessity of reanimating physical corpses and individualized matter. Tertullian, for example, can say quite straightforwardly that one reason we must be restored again to the same body at the resurrection is that we would not be the same person. And if we weren't the same person, another person would be rewarded for our martyrdom or to put this in his language. For how absurd and moreover, how unjust, and on both grounds, how unworthy of God for one substance to do the work and another to be checked off with the wages, this flesh being butchered in martyrdom while another receives the crown. And the other way round, this flesh wallowing in foulness while another receives damnation. What he means about this is that the body, the flesh, in which you are doing things now is an important part of the exercise of virtue and identity that makes you who you are. If you're, get, if you're given new flesh, if you're given a new body at the resurrection, then the flesh that did all of the good work doesn't get the reward. Martyrdom here is a cipher for thinking about the resurrection of the body in general. But is martyrdom, as some like Walker, um, Walker Bynum have argued the reason that fleshy resurrection gained popularity and eventually dominated other theories of the afterlife. And in discussing this, I want to first talk about the history of scholarship. The difficulty with this theory is that when people assume this kind of connection between the experience of martyrdom and the idea of the resurrection of the flesh, what they're assuming is that, these, that the resurrection of the flesh is a kind of exceptional idea. It necessitates explanation and that fleshy resurrection would never have become doctrine had it not been for the experience of persecution. In the history of scholarship, the roots of this idea can be traced to the related notions about the origins of apocalypticism and the idea of resurrection in Second Temple Judaism. Noting the sort of prominence of this idea amongst ancient Jews, the New Testament scholar Oscar Kuhlman argued that the resurrection of the body could only have come from Second Temple Judaism because the concept of death and resurrection is incompatible with the Greek belief in immortality. More specifically, Scholars have tended to understand the relatively sudden appearance of apocalyptically styled discussions of resurrection in the Hellenistic period, that sort of third, second century BCE. Um, they've noticed that there's a sudden like, explosion in this kind of literature in that period, and they have tied that to the generalized or particular suffering that the Jewish, that the Jewish people experienced under the Ptolemies. George Nicholsberg's seminal work, Resurrection, Immortality, and Eternal Life in Intertestamental Judaism and Early Christianity actually opens with three chapters on religious persecution. And his chapter on resurrection, quote, unrelated to persecution, oppression, and injustice, traces all of the examples that don't fit into his overarching theory. The roots of this idea in sort of recent scholarship trace back all the way to 19th century scholarly circles. 
in which the matrix of motifs and ideas that we call apocalyptic, those visions, angels, ideas about the end of the world, caused embarrassment to 19th century scholars. For them, resurrection of the body was part of the facile theological production of a beleaguered community. Take, for example, this quote from the founder of the Strasbourg School of Biblical Studies, in which in talking about Jesus, he says, can his religion, else so pure, so spiritual, so essentially free from all alloy of earth, have been consummated by an eschatology so grossly material? This pretty much sums up what 19th century scholars think about apocalyptic and the attendant doctrine of the resurrection of the body, which if they had had the language, they surely would have described as zombies. The idea of resurrected flesh is so metaphysically sticky that pristine, dispassionate philosophical discourse could not possibly have generated it, we're told. As a result, when some early Christians deny the possibility of the resurrection of the flesh or appeal to stoic notions of a non-fleshy uh, spiritual body, they are somehow presented as being more committed to the intellectual ideas and scientific findings of their day. This division ignores the manifold evidence for notions of embodied afterlives in various ancient Greek and Roman literary traditions and the diversity of ancient Jewish views of the afterlife. It's actually not only scholars of Christianity that do this. There's an increased interest in late antique Roman thought in the afterlife, and that's explained in exactly the same way. The idea that as the Roman Empire collapses, Romans now turn to the afterlife for sort of spiritual succor, that they look to sort of the God beyond the God of this world, the true God, um, to sort of escape the political realities in which they lived. The effect of this, however, is to dismiss the theological underpinnings of the resurrection of the body. In this way, thinking about the resurrection is subordinated to a secondary role in the history of ideas. It becomes a sort of responsive mode of thought clouded by grief. It is a contingent doctrine. Now, to be sure, increased interest in the afterlife often corresponds to the experience of political pressure, social marginalization, and outright persecution. But the historical impetus for thinking about resurrected bodies does not render the product of those thoughts irrelevant or contingent. Moreover, as I'm going to argue for the rest of my talk today, those authors who scrutinize the mangled body of the martyr worked within a broader philosophically informed conversation about bodily continuity and identity. Historical events provide a focusing lens, but they do not create the conversation. And I will argue that the martyr's body was not merely something for the, for the philosophically educated person to intellectually trip over. It was an example with which Christian theologians actively reasoned, and it formed part of the ethical program of the resurrection. So, with all of this in mind, I want to turn to the use of the martyred body in early Christian discussions of the afterlife. And I'm going to argue that the martyred body did calcify a number of key suppositions for Christian apologists and theologians who thought about the resurrection of the body in general, but it also served as a cipher for broader conversations about identity. To refer back to my earlier quotation from Tertullian, the concern here is actually not martyrdom. It's not martyrdom in particular, but identity in general. Tertullian assumes that we need all of the matter that we had before in order to really be ourselves. And the rest of my talk this evening will focus on two sets of interlocking concerns. The question of bodily integrity and the question of bodily functionality in the resurrection. What I believe is that in order to appreciate the conversation about resurrected martyrs, it is also important to discuss why it is that integrity and functionality mattered at all 
to early Christians. So even before Athenagoras mentally dissected the cannibal, there was a conversation among ancient Greek and Roman philosophers about the continuity of identity in inanimate objects. No one has to die or be eaten by cannibals for change to threaten the nature of who they are. Even the most mundane bodily alterations shake the foundation of our identity. People worried about identity and change without ever thinking of reanimated corpses. The classic philosophical example is the case of the ship of Theseus, which I'm sure most of you know. The Athenians, we are told, preserved the ship in which the heroic Theseus had sailed by removing and replacing old planks that had rotted through with new ones. They installed the new hardware in such a way that the structure of the original ship was retained and were invited to consider by generations of philosophers, is this the same ship? Is it the form of the thing or is it the matter that makes it up that provides the ship with its identity. What was theoretical for an agencyless ship was of pressing importance to the human person. Both the human body and its memories were mutable, ever changing and unstable. This idea was first introduced by means of a joke by the fifth century playwright Epicharmus. In it, his, he has this fiscally irresponsible character who gets into a lot of debt. And when he's called to account for those, he says, well, I'm an entirely new person now, so I cannot be held responsible for these debts. You may be more familiar from this from James Joyce's Ulysses, where exactly the same thing happens. The central idea, as it's described by philosophers thereafter, is as the growing argument. And it's usually explained by recourse to a pile of pebbles. If you have a pile of seven pebbles and you add another pebble to it, you now have a pile of eight pebbles. The pile of seven pebbles no longer exists. Seven is no longer there, you have eight. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking you just take one away, you have seven, it's fine. But that's not the argument. The same argument can be applied to human beings. But as a person grows, they are replaced by a new person as they change. What this argument highlights is the fluidity of the human person over time. It is for this reason that Heraclitus wrote that a person cannot step into the same river twice. Change is a process in which the self constantly dies and is replaced. The issue of material continuity and the preservation of identity should in fact trouble you every day of your life. We are all at every moment in a state of flux. We start small and over the course of our lives we grow taller, bigger, and eventually as our skeletal structure compresses, a little bit smaller. In between, we expand and contract. We ingest foreign matter as nutriment. It forms part of our bodies and it is lost to us when we expend it as energy and discard it as excretion. If you're gonna put this in modern scientific arguments every once in a while, there's an article in you know, the Times about how your cells turn over once every seven years and so you're a whole new person now than you were seven years ago. That would be the modern article about this. In his defense of the resurrection, Athenagoras wants to turn this to his advantage. He appeals to the instability of human identity as a means of normalizing the idea of resurrected bodies. Discontinuity between the body as it is now and the reconstituted celestial body, he says, is not a problem because a certain discontinuity is observed concerning the permanence of humans because we inherited discontinuity from the beginning by the will of the maker. The transitory state of the human condition, something that really troubled his philosophical counterparts, becomes a foreshadowing of eschatological change. To those who might say, Will you be different? Will you be changed? What about your matter? What's been lost? He would say, 
well, that's just a problem of human existence. And he'll even attribute that to the creator. For Aristotle, the issue of growth and ingestion have much more serious implications because for the philosopher Aristotle, he took it as axiomatic that two bodies cannot coexist in the same space. So if that's true, how do you explain digestion? How do you explain eating food? The quandary led him to posit that continuity is connected not to matter, but to form. The nutritional matter that you consume doesn't accede to the matter of a person, it accedes to their form, to their eidos. By form, Aristotle means the defining characteristics of a thing. And he compares the form of the body to sort of a tube through which water might be poured. So if you pour a lot of water into the tube, it'll grow bigger. But the tube is still supplying the structure and shape of the thing. In the same way, a body grows larger when additional nutrition is added to it. Some of us struggle with this a great deal. But the fundamental structure and form of your body, of your person, let's say, remains the same. The form is also self-preserving and structural, and that form exists regardless of whether or not you supply additional matter to it. It can expand or wither, but its structure and form is essentially the same. It is precisely to this theory of form as a guarantor of identity that the third century Christian writer Origen appeals in his defense of the resurrection of a spiritual body. Calling back to Heraclitus in Aristotle, he notes that the body may change such that it is not the same for two consecutive days, but that identity is guaranteed because the form, the eidos, he says, characterizing the body remains the same. In this way, uh, you can see early Christian authors using these philosophical concepts to try and defend this impossible idea. Resurrection, however, was not just a question of collecting together disparate matter into its appropriate parts. For those second and third century Christian thinkers embroiled in heated debates about whether you could possibly have a resurrected body that had flesh, functionality was a preeminent concern. The notion that a functionless body part could be ideal was ethically problematic to many ancient philosophers. A great deal of conversation about the self in antiquity is ethical, in character. In the first book of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle rather famously argues that every human being has an individual goal, a telos, a sort of a purpose. Every characteristic activity, that's work, ergon, he argues, has as its goal a specific end, a telos. He provides as examples first a series of professions like a flute player, a craftsman or a leather worker and asks if a kind of person, let's say a craftsman has a telos, should not a human being qua human being also have a telos? And he then goes on to really break down this example into parts of the body. His second set of examples involve the eye, the hand and the foot. And he says that they too must have telos if the whole body has telos. So what Aristotle is really concerned about here is, yeah, that's meant to be blank, it's okay. Um, he's really concerned about ethical order that undergirds human conduct. And the orientation of this conduct towards eudaimonia, that sort of happiness or flourishing, which is supposed to be the goal of philosophy. And if in order to have eudaimonia, your whole body needs to be organized towards a goal. And if the parts of your body need to be organized towards a goal, this raises a lot of issues about what you're going to do with the parts of the body that you've reassembled in the sort of heavenly surgeon's office at the resurrection. This, this same interest in purpose, in telos, reappears in Christian theories of the resurrection. But often people don't notice it because, as famous as it is, the theory and its primary source, the Nicomachean ethics, tend to be classified by scholars as ethics, not metaphysics. Living the good life by following a virtue is the chief concern of ancient philosophy. And the idea that the parts of oneself 
are, are useless or fulfill no purpose, raises real questions about the value of those parts and the abil ability of a person to flourish. And this, in turn, raises questions for the heavenly body. Why have genitals in heaven or limbs or a digestive system if they no longer have a purpose? Why put the martyred body back together only to have it slumped listlessly in the heavenly throne with which it was rewarded? Put in the terms of Tertullian's opponents to the resurrection, what will be the use of the cavity of our mouth and its rows of teeth and the passage of the throat and the crossroads of the stomach and the gulf of the belly and the entangled tissues of the intestines when there will no longer be a place for eating and drinking? Why would we have loins being conscious of semen and the other genitals in both sexes, as well as the enclosures of conception and the fountains of the breast when sexual intercourse and pregnancy and the nurturing of infants shall cease? Ultimately, what will be the use of the entire body when clearly the whole is free from use? Tertullian's response to these questions at once dismisses the line of inquiry while simultaneously seeking to reassign the purpose of these named body parts. So he actually both flatly states that the parts of the body will be liberated from their functions in the resurrection while he's simultaneously saying that they're going to have new uses. So the teeth, he writes, do not only chew food, they also guard the tongue and the tongue and the gullet assist in speaking. In the very first gesture to aesthetics, he also says that we have teeth for adornment because they look pretty. I would argue that it does depend on the teeth. But this, this is Tertullian and not me. The genitals, on the other hand, create a special set of problems. And in the history of scholarship, people have tended to assume that these proto-Catholic authors just have problems with sex. And I would argue they don't just have problems with sex, they have problems with functionality. So take a look at what Tertullian does with the genitals. He redefines the nether regions in scatological terms. There are holes in the lower regions of man and woman in which no doubt flow sexual pleasures, but why are they not rather regarded as filters for the discharge of natural fluids? Women, moreover, have within them a place for semen to gather. But are they not for the secretion of those sanguineous tissues that their more sluggish sex is inadequate to disperse? Now, his logic here causes some confusion. And this is even more acute for us who have no idea what he's talking about, medically speaking. Your response is, well, that's just not true. The excreta are, in ancient thinking, the byproducts of digestion. But in ancient thinking, that's exclusively defecation. So urination is just not a category to be applied here. In his commentary on this passage, Taylor Petrie notes the ancient medical commonplace that women's bodies were cooler than those of men as a means of understanding why all the blood, the menstruation, and afterbirth might gather in the womb and need to be expelled from the body. And that excess blood, that's a product of digestion, not a product of sex. But having done that, he concludes with respect to the excreta that it's just not clear how defecation is meant to raise the status of the lower regions of the body for Tertullian's readers, especially since these functions would surely cease in the resurrection or we're suddenly going to have a whole host of questions about bathrooms in heaven. The tension persists in trying to find a noble purpose for these parts. The tension can be slightly eased. I realize many of you just ate, so please forgive me for what I'm about to tell you. By augmenting this reading with two other ancient medical conventions about women's bodies. First, the general idea that menstruation was for women a means of evacuating, accumulating nutriment. nutriment. So women's bodies are cooler, and they need to get rid of stuff, and they don't produce semen, so they get rid of that excess through menstruation. And second, the rather unusual idea that, I'm sorry, that the womb has the potential to become a repository for filth and parasites. 
According to the Hippocratic, yes, that Hippocrates text on diseases, tapeworms, which are associated with fecal matter, are formed in the fetus in utero. The association is a little complicated, and there's some, but there's some medical precedent for seeing the womb as actually a receptacle of fecal matter, which if you read a lot of Tertullian explains so much about his views of women and also how he writes about the incarnation. The strange relationship between the life-giving womb and the filthy detritus of the human condition that sort of characterizes Tertullian's difficult relationship with female bodies actually predates Tertullian. It's found in medical texts. By supplanting human generation with the notional purposes of digestive filtration, he's actually able to redirect the functions of the genitals towards something else, the sort of morally and aesthetically complicated issue of eating. But at least you have good biblical precedent because a whole host of biblical texts will tell you that there is a feast ongoing in heaven that you get to go to when you die. The crowning moment in Tertullian's argument for non-functioning body parts fuses together these issues of form and function in a clear, almost dismissive reference to the classic example of the ship of Theseus. He argues against his opponents that if they will concede that a reconstituted ship is by virtue of its structure the same ship as it originally was, surely they should allow the hypothetical benefactor of the ship's restoration, obviously God, to retire the ship from service without demanding that the ship be dismantled. If a rich and generous owner, while granting to his private sentiment or his public reputation the boon of the ship's restoration and that alone, has expressed the wish for it to work no more, will you say that it has no need of its original structure from now on to be inactive, since thus it beseems the bare salvation of a ship without work to do? And you will have no right on the ground that the members will in future be inactive to deny the possibility of its existing anew, for it is feasible for a thing to exist anew and nonetheless be inactive. But it cannot be said to be inactive if it does not exist. Moreover, if it exists, it will be possible for it also not to be inactive. For in God's presence, nothing can be inactive. Now, you can see what he's doing. He's definitely concerned with functionality and purpose. And at the end, it might seem as if he's collapsing into the cheapest of Christian arguments, which is all things are possible with God. But that's not what he's doing. In fact, he's using Aristotelian metaphysics to prove that the parts of the body are not useless, even if they don't function as they did when you were alive. So, this requires some knowledge of Aristotle. For Aristotle, God is the unmoved mover, sort of like the battery in the Energizer bunny, you know, from the commercials. That is Aristotle's God. It's the unmoved mover, the one responsible for the locomotion of everything in the universe, including the eternal rotation of the heavenly things. So the things closest to the unmoved mover in Aristotelian thought are constantly spinning by virtue of their proximity to Aristotle's God. Granting that, Tertullian says, how would it even be possible for resurrected bodies to be inactive? So he's playing off the idea of motion and function and replacing human functionality with just the notion of eternal motion. In tackling these questions, Athenagoras takes a slightly different approach. Like Tertullian, he maintains that body parts are integral for providing continuity of identity, but he greatly expands upon a theme touched in Tertullian that the flesh and individual parts of the body need to be preserved for justice. Because human beings are incapable of meeting out punishment in a just fashion. So in a temporal courtroom, Here's one of the examples he gives. The most heinous criminal can only be executed one time. But in the eternity of God's justice, punishment can be more fairly distributed so that a mass murderer can be constantly executed. In making this argument, Athenagoras appeals to an often overlooked feature of early Christian conversations about immortality, namely the necessity of a hell-bound body 
for the distribution of justice. I am in no way endorsing his vision of eternal punishment. On Judgment Day, the entirety of a person, all of his or her flesh, must be present before God for reward or punishment. If they don't have flesh, they're not a person. And if they don't have the same flesh, then there's no continuity of personhood. It would be, as Tertullian said earlier, unjust to be punishing a different person for the crimes they committed when, that someone else committed when they were alive. So Tertullian is explicit that continuity is guaranteed by the resurrection of the substance of the members of the body. And he sort of somewhat is, he's willing to give up the idea that functionality is so important. But Athenagoras disagrees, saying that the living will be purely the same if everything is the same, which serves as its parts. He goes on to say that the preservation of the material substance of the body is a concern, but the continuation of functions is also important because without them, the resurrected person cannot be the same person that was alive. Moreover, he's very unwilling to give up integrity, substance, or function. He writes that God knows the nature of human bodies, both in their entirety, how they're put together, and in every part, by which he means the parts of the body, and every particle, every piece of matter that makes up those parts. Athenagoras' discussion of the importance of the body as the actor in the exercise of virtue goes a lot further than a mere eschatological evaluation of deeds. The embodied practice of virtue, which we might call the purpose of the whole body, has an eschatological orientation and anticipating what's a very common atheistic argument that we have today, or at least caricature of atheism, he writes that if there is never to be a judgment on the deeds of humans, then they will have nothing greater than irrational beasts, or rather they will fare more miserably than these beasts in subordinating the passions and having given heed to piety, justice, and every other virtue. Then the life of beasts or savages is best. Virtue is senseless, the threat of judgment a huge joke. To cultivate pleasure is the greatest good. And the common doctrine and law of all will be that which is beloved to the unbridled and lecherous. Eat, drink, and be merry. For the end of such a life is not pleasure, according to some, but complete insensibility. In other words, if there's no judgment after death, why don't we all go to Vegas now? It's quite far. It is quite far. The teleological goal of virtue is quite clearly the final judgment for Athenagoras. But this orientation doesn't demand for him living like a resurrected body. So resurrected bodies, nobody thinks, and it's not my fault that this is the case, that you get to have sex in heaven. Well, Latter-day Saints do but no second or third century Christian apologists. Um, and so in some authors, you should live now as you would in the resurrection, live chaste lives now. But for Athenagoras, that is not the case because only the flesh that contributed to life and the labors in life according to nature is integral to personhood. Um, for Athenagoras, um, reproduction is much like Plato, it's necessary and natural. Now, sexual desire, that's not necessary or natural, but reproduction is. And that's a distinction that Athenagoras makes over and over. As natural parts of the person, therefore, you must have reproductive organs that are inseparable from the soul, and they must be present in the resurrection. If you want to ask him how it is that he doesn't need to have um, reproduction in heaven, he would say that sexual desire comes from the humors and you don't need the humors in heaven because they're sort of the extraneous matter of Aristotle that doesn't accede to your personhood. And so you can, once you eradicate the humors, then you won't have sexual desire. And so you'll still have body parts, but you won't have sexual desire. And that's really important to him <laughs> um, to get rid of these kind of fluctuating elements. So the flesh that's essential to yourself, that will be preserved. But those parts without purpose, the fluctuating humors, they will, and this is a quote, they have no place among the things created by God. 
if we were to press him on whether or not the reproductive organs are oriented towards any kind of goal in heaven, like what are you doing with your genitals there? Because they're going to be functionless. He might respond that the ultimate goal of the body parts is to produce virtue through the exercise of self-restraint. And that remains constant. That's their purpose, self-restraint. It's just that the temptation device, once you get rid of the insidious humors, will no longer exist. So resurrecting the body is about restoring the conduits and architecture of virtue. And for Athenagoras, as for many others, there is no greater example of virtue than a martyr whose exercise of virtue is located precisely in their flesh. To abandon the resurrection of the flesh would be to abandon not just one's individual identity, but the very substance that merited salvation. At stake in so much of this was the issue of identity. What parts of the person were integral for the preservation of individual personhood? And as intelligible as that idea seems to us living in our post-Reformation world in which we're hyper-conscious of our individual selves, it would be a mistake to think that everyone in the ancient world worried about this. As Christopher Gill has written, ancient thinkers are not committed to the notion of an individual self in the way that moderns are. And a number of New Testament scholars have argued that 1 Corinthians 15, Paul's very classic piece on the resurrection, about what the resurrection will be like, envisages following the Stoics an idea of the resurrection as a process of transformation in which your resurrected body is transformed into a spiritual body, so no flesh whatsoever. And if that reading's correct, then probably as an individual Christian, you would lose all sense of consciousness and individual identity as you reached union with God. You just be kind of absorbed. You have no consciousness of who you were. So if that bothers you, that's probably not your passage. For later writers interested in martyrdom, however, individual identities must be preserved for the purpose of justice. The vision of the heavenly altar in Revelation 6 has the souls beneath it calling out for justice. In a double reference to the day of execution and the last judgment, the martyrs of the passion of Perpetua and Felicity invite the crowd to take careful note of what we look like so that you will recognize us on that day. And both Cyprian and Origen agree that enthronement, reign, and judgment with God in the heavenly tribunal are the rewards of the faithful martyred dead. You may not have known that if you die as a martyr, you get to participate in judgment on judgment day, which feels a little bit like the fantasy I have of like my high school reunion. <laughs> Most pointedly of all, Tertullian insists on the preservation of identity for the judgment of the persecutors. He writes, I see so many rulers whose reception into the heavens was publicly announced with their own heads groaning now in the lowest darkness, governors of provinces too, who persecuted the name of the Lord in fires more fierce than those with which they raged against Christians. Once again, martyrdom and persecution are just serving as ciphers for virtuous and wicked human beings. The emphasis on judgment and justice necessitates, as Petrie has written, a theory of the soul that makes it inseparable from the body. So, having dragged you literally into fecal matter in this talk, what can we actually say about the relationship between martyrdom and the development of the idea of the resurrection of the body in early Christians? Well, in the first place, what I hope I have shown is how the conversation about martyrdom and resurrection is not just a grief-struck response to persecution, trauma, and vengeance. The experience of martyrdom provokes theological reasoning that is not merely contingent or derivative. It is sophisticated and even elegant. What the ship of Theseus was to Greek philosophers, the martyr was to Christian philosophers, even if they're not quite as skilled. While this argument might seem to be a rather slender exercise in hair splitting, it has profound implications for how we think about the development 
of the idea of the resurrection of the flesh. Resurrection is as at home in these so-called logical discussions about identity as it is among emotional responses to grief and persecution. And while I would contest the evaluation implicit in this most platonic of binaries, like logical, emotionary, binary, I think I raise it because it is important to note the rhetorical effects of categorizing any theological idea or position as merely an expression of trauma. What I would further argue is that while the history of martyrdom and the history of the idea of fleshy resurrection are interwoven, they move together in a world informed by philosophy and ancient science. Previous scholarship has tended to place this conversation squarely and exclusively within the realm of metaphysics, but the resurrection of the flesh does not only tug on the underpinnings of the cosmos and anthropology, it also gestures to the often neglected ethical importance of the function of the parts of the body. For Christians, as I have argued before, resurrection can function as an act of resistance to structures of oppressive power. But even where it achieves this goal, it is part of a broader conversation about the very nature of who we are and how our identities can or might not survive change. In this context, the role of the martyr is to magnify and sharpen as ciphers of virtue, as paradigms of bodily fortitude, and also, quite paradoxically, as emblems of human frailty, capturing both the heights of enfleshed human potential and the fleeting reality of that same flesh. Thank you. Canada, thank you for a really fascinating excursus. I think you'll agree on, on this uh, most interesting of topics. And I'm sure that it is, uh, has provoked all sorts of questions and, and comments and um, subjects for discussion. So um, I'll leave it open to the floor now uh, for questions and discussion. Thank you. Jeremy. Um, you talked about the idea, as it seems to be held by some early Christian writers, that the original physical bodies would be restored mm -hmm. and so on. Um, did any of them make any statements as to whether it be the adult body, is it the body just before death, or is it the body when it was in its prime or its height of right. fame? And, um, right, because that, that's, I mean, I realize that I dragged you into the slight more philosophical enclaves of this discussion, but obviously huge questions about how old will you be? What will you look like? Um, and if it's all of the parts of your body that you had while you were alive, what happens to all the hair you cut off and, all, and your fingernails and your skin cells? I mean, you could have some real talons. Um, so yes, they do start to worry about that. And the person who really starts to worry about this is Augustine who worries about this and starts to introduce notions of aesthetics, like a beautiful body, and talks about us all being resurrected at the age of 30, because that was the age that Jesus was. Um, but it's also just the ideal age in ancient Greco-Roman thought. Everyone thinks 30 is the perfect age, not too young, not above, over the hill, let's say, I don't know, maybe 38. <laughs> um, so... What about somebody say they're smart at 24? <laughs> exactly. So, there are, there are a couple of questions. One is, are you, are you, so in Greek mythology, you would look the way you looked at the moment of your death. And the problem is many of us would not like to look that way. But this is just, this is not purely a sort of like aspirational thing, much as I, I would like to be, you know, maybe 20 pounds lighter or something. That's not how it is. We have all of these texts indicating that you might be able to be recognized. Um, Paul would tell you, if we would just let us reason it out together, shall we? Paul would tell us to go back to that first resurrected body. And, and even though he tells you that, people never do this, and that would be the body of Jesus, um, which is sometimes recognizable and sometimes not. It can be touched. It certainly seems to preserve the marks of the execution, although I have a whole article about how he's not actually bleeding from his hands. He probably is from his side when they see him there. Um, it's probably, he's probably scarring at this point. And that word for mark in Greek always means scar when it's used as bodies. 
It never means through and through wound. Just fun fact. Just now you know. You don't have to read my article. So that would be one place to go. There's going to be a huge discussion that happens to what happens to miscarried infants, things like that. And everyone's going to want to say that they're older. But we have some tours of hell in which parents who do expose their children, sort of fourth, fifth century tours of hell, in which parents who expose their children or kill them or abort them preterm, they will be dipped in mire up to their necks and their children, the little infants, will sit nearby and shoot what seem to be like laser beams or like lightning bolts out of their eyes at these people. I'm not making this up, I promise. So in that instance, they're the same age. They haven't aged at all, but it is a tour of hell. Um, and also, why are they not in heaven? Why are they in? Because in, in the theology of the, of the apocalypse, that, that's an unusual thing. Um, the apocalypse does think that they should be in heaven. We don't yet have like a limbo or a purgatory for that. So Augustine will tell you. Let's go with Augustine because he's nice. That you will be beautiful. That all of the nail clippings and things, would they will just accede to your form. You're not going to be deformed. You'll just be yourself. It'll just be more densely compressed. Um, there are some discussions about whether you need all of the matter when you're alive back or if you just need enough matter. Um, and that you will be 30. And that even though you don't need skin, Augustine will say, because do you need skin in heaven? Is it very cold there? I, I, I mean... I feel like it's cold when I'm in airplanes, but um, that's a joke. <laughs> um, um, I don't really think that we live in the clouds. Like I did take physics at some point. Um, but Augustine will say, you need the skin for beauty. And that is the point in human history where people start to care about beauty and ideals, and you can, and which is not Paul's language, and yet somehow plays out in all of the artwork you find, even to this day. Um, there's a cathedral in Los Angeles that has these tapestries. I don't know if anyone's seen them, a procession of the saints in Our Lady. They're beautiful, aren't they? But I will say that is an attractive group of saints. I mean, I know it's Los Angeles, but they're very beautiful. And every, in every place where the artists who took great pains to make sure that the saints looked the way they looked when they were alive, in every instance where he has a hypothetical saint or a saint that he doesn't know what the saint looked like, take, say, Augustine, he does make them very attractive. So Augustine looks a lot like the actor Denzel Washington. <laughs> he does, he does. And um, there's nothing wrong with that, but you do sort of kind of have to ask yourself, now we have this like commitment to beauty. A, where did that come from? Augustine, um, who has sort of some different notion of beauty than we do, and, and what that means for people who have bodies that don't conform to that now. Question, Daniel. Um, I have a, a, a minor protest in regards to that question. Um, uh, I'm not entirely convincing. Uh, that, uh, say, you're, you're, you're pagan philosophers who, who believe in a, a pneumatic body going, mm -hmm. uh, ascending into unity with God and so on, um, Plotinus, Proclus, yeah, because we all believe that individuality exists at the highest level. Um, and, and so, uh, just a bit concerned with that, but my question, though, is before Augustine, does anyone deal with the problem of temporality in the body? Because the argument could be made that because a body moves through space, it inevitably exists in a succession of moments. If it exists in a succession of moments, perhaps we'll be held by this kind of divided existence outside of the unity of God, outside of his eternity, and not able to fully uh, uh, participate in the means of division. Mm -hmm. um, I know Augustine deals with this, but has anyone talked about this before? Yeah, so I don't, I don't want to sell us short on the pneumatic body. <laughs> And what I would say Paul is doing, if we're thinking about in terms of sort of stoic terms rather than the neoplatonic authors you were writing about. So um, in stoic terms, I mean, there is a whole conversation about one, 
if you're subsumed in the conflagration and then you saw it again, will you be the, are you numerically identical Plato's, that whole conversation? So there is a concern about whether you can preserve that pneuma. I, I would probably want to contest your reading of the Neoplatonists a little bit in that, yes, of course, there's identity, but once you get, and, and then there's all of that concern about if you have the spherical bodies of the Timaeus, how are you recognized? And um, you can have Plotinus and Proclus talk about characteristics that make you recognizable. You can have Iamblichus saying that he can recognize, you can recognize the voices, um, things like that. But then there's an additional concern, which you certainly see in Augustine, which is once you do have the beatific vision, or once you exist outside of time, you lose your memories. And once you lose your memories, <laughs> who are, you know, there's a tension. And I, th I think what I would say about the Neo. Um, Platonists is I think I think they're concerned about what would happen once you once you do finally get to that upper level maybe less Proclus and Plotinus than say like Plato wouldn't worry so much even though the whole goal of souls coming down here originally was to be true to themselves or something um, but I think that in Augustine you see uh, that tension played out about identity versus the beatific vision. Do we see it in other authors between, say, Paul and Augustine? I'm not so sure that we do. Um, we do, in certain contexts, see great concern about being reunited. And I, I would even, and I would concede, and I don't mean to say that it's not a feature, that certainly that that might be about grief. <laughs> Um, and that longing to be reunited with people who will recognize you is about grief, in as much as it's also about vengeance. I don't know if I fully answered your question. Um, You're welcome. Yes, uh, given the, the pan of worms, um, literal and metaphorical that you wrote in Augustine, uh, specifically um, the theology of the resurrection of the body, how, from a, a modern systematic theological perspective, how sympathetic are you to the very a historian. Um, I don't create things. Well, I, I'm, you know, I'm one of those historians who, when I think about the systematic view, um, I'm really eager to poke, poke holes in other people's ideas. Um, I guess what I would say, and what concerns me about the resurrection of the body, is not the resurrection of the body, but what happens once you start describing it and painting it and imposing onto perfection, which is not in the New Testament, but once you start imposing onto that real body. So these ones, the Ravenna mosaics, we'll just take them because they're on the screen. Um, we don't have them. This is a procession of female saints. And the first thing you'll notice is that they kind of all look identical don't they? And they have, that's one of the reasons they have their names above their heads. Um, and I don't have her up here, but equally identical to these ones are Saints Perpetua and Felicity, and pretty much anyone in the audience would have known that Perpetua was from Tunisia and Felicity was a Numidian slave girl. So they probably didn't look like Roman aristocrats. And everybody would have known that. So I'm deeply concerned about that, not just in terms of race, or there's, there's a very healthy conversation about whether or not you would have women in the resurrection, um, given that women are, in Aristotle's terms, like underbaked bread. Surely you would want to be cooked properly, ladies, in the resurrection. Um, so I think race and um, gender are really obvious places to poke at. But I would be concerned about, and this is what worries me about the mosaics and Our Lady of the Angels, I would be worried about us depicting heavenly bodies using the aesthetics of um, wealthy bodies or healthy ones or able bodies to combine another one of my interests, that deeply concerns me. And um, when this comes up, people will say, yes, but you know, I'm deeply sympathetic to the disabled, say, but you can't really convince me that I want to be like that. Um, and surely heaven is sort of aspirational perfection. And maybe that's the case, but the problem with the be all you can be model of the resurrection is that it's ultimately just, um, it's consumeristic. It's whatever I can persuade you, you want to be. And I'm not sure that a consumeristic model of resurrection is a really such a good idea. That's as far as I'm willing to go down that line because I'm a historian. Michael. 
telling the story too. <laughs> and the, one of the things I'm interested in here is the, which you're going to see, is the production, productive tension between precisely the desire to maintain selfhood and that desire to become Christ-like or imitating whatever the, the ideal model here is. That not only appears in these images, which as you say are very similar to identical images, but which individuate from martyrs of economic value with their names. Mm -hmm. And with the similar enterprise of writing acts of multiple martyrs in the first place, martyr acts mm -hmm. tend towards being the same story, mm -hmm. but they each have their own individuality. Mm -hmm. Is there something that you can say about this being a constant push pull in excellent image and indeed in imagining an ideal future that you want to have it both ways? Yeah, I I, def I love the idea of production tension, productive tension, and I sort of I, I love your reading of the mosaics too. And I do think that you can have a productive tension, so I think you can preserve in perpetuity aspects of identity that might cause you pain now, but you probably can't have pain. There's a distinction in the work of the theologian Audre Lorde between pain and suffering. <laughs> um, now she wants to get rid of suffering because of the history of redemptive suffering but you it, and as a biblical scholar I want to flip that because that's just not what the Bible says um, but you could get rid of those parts of, of identity that you could get rid of the painfulness part and preserve the identity part as a means of doing that in terms of what happens when you're all imitating Christ a single model and you're all being assimilated to that yes you can have a productive tension there between your identity and sort of assimilation to the divine I think my problem, my questions emerge with what happens once you start drawing that? Or once you start telling people that don't worry, it's tough that they're X way now, but in heaven, we'll fix that. Yeah, one more question here. One more question. Um, and, um, you were saying that, um, I think it was Tatanian, about the, in the terms of the resurrection, that um, part of it was to do with justice and punishment and so on. Now, um, Origen didn't have the idea of punishment. He had the apotheosis of everything being restored. Mm -hmm. And how did he resolve the question of justice? Well, th this, is, this is sort of partially where he's going to go down, isn't it? So the idea of restoration. And the perhaps misunderstanding that he sort of unproblematically um, thinks everything's going to be restored and hunky-dory, which I think is maybe even a deliberate misreading of him. Um, I don't think he's as concerned about this as say Tertullian is um, and it's, that's not surprising an Alexandrian author much more interested in different kinds of metaphysical questions versus a North African author very interested in the administration of justice um, I think it's not surprising so I, do, I don't necessarily even though they're all writing about resurrection expect that they should be able we should be able to use them to answer the same questions um, and I think, or I think too highly of Origen to try and sort of answer it for him using his work. Well, I think you'll all agree that it has been uh, a wonderful uh, evening. Uh, we, we have uh, really been stimulated by your thoughts and your ideas. And I hope that that will carry over into the reception that should surely follow because uh, Certainly wine and other things should miraculously appear at the back of the room any minute now. Um, so please do carry on uh, the conversation afterwards and take the time to, to mingle, uh, to meet new people, and indeed to restore old friendships as well. Uh, so thank you all very much for your presence here. And especially thank you so much, Candida, for taking the time to be with us and for an absolutely uh, scintillating lecture. Thank you. Thank you.